all addictions are driven by the desire to escape something. just got sucked into this whole world of video games and it was like part of your life it was almost the only part of your life He started off with this going for an hour, two hours, two hours turned into four, four turned into six, six turns into twelve, and he's now into the snowball effect that he's got to play that game. I am addicted to the game, but I'm not fully addicted. Like, I can quit whenever I want. To be on top of the game, you really got to dedicate your life to the video game itself and not worry about reality. Anymore. I really don't. This is a disclaimer. I'm active duty as an officer, so I have to put this slide up there because if I make a fool of myself, it represents me, okay? So don't send the president an email or call the White House, okay? So. This reflects my own views, and plus I'm also the founder of Real Battle Ministries. That's my financial disclosure. And also I'm an author of a, a book called Hooked on Games. So this is some of my academic background. So I have a PhD in MD from Johns Hopkins. I received six full-ride scholarships to medical school. And so I was really cocky, number one. Number two, I was an atheist. So definitely that Luke 16, or Luke 13, 16 passage, I was the one who served idols. So I know about idol worship, and that's why I also um, got involved in my addiction. So the closet secret is that I'm a gaming addict. So this is a picture that I dug up for a local television station who wanted a picture of me when I was in med school. Uh, don't play games because you have more hair if you do, okay, if you, if you don't play games. Uh, gaming caused me to lose my hair. No. Um, but this is a picture of my son at six months old. And I broke down in tears when I saw this picture. Because like all addictions, it takes you away from time, from the things that matter, okay, from God. So when I was addicted, I couldn't find the Lord. I didn't spend time with my family. I didn't spend time with my kid. Because I was playing 50 to 100 hours a week for over nine years. So I lived this addiction. And not only did I play video games, but the research shows that gaming addicts also use pornography. So I was a porn addict as well. And so you can see that even though this picture with the low resolution, I can recognize that game in the background. Anybody recognize that game? It's not Pong, not Space Invaders. It's actually one of the first multiplayer online role-playing games called Ultima Online, okay? So I was a gamer back in high school. I was a three-sports letterman. I was smart enough to get six full-ride scholarships to med school. But because I was an ungodly person as an atheist, I didn't know how to deal with stress and having a young family and being married in medical school. So this was my drug of choice. This is how I escaped to numb my pain. And I'm going to show you data how people can use gaming to numb their pain. So my goal here is to to share with you how to be a game changer. And this is my words of encouragement. The addiction rate for all drugs, alcohol, 
as well as gaming, is about 10% of the population. So one in 10. So we have probably about 100, 150 people here. There's at least 15 to 20 people here that are going to be addicts. But here's my words of encouragement, is that that addictive trait is a go-getter trait. So when focused incorrectly, the addict goes towards drugs, alcohol, and idols, okay, or things that, that are not healthy for, for us. But when we're focused on a, a path that the Lord wants us to, we actually find our purpose in life. And that same trait, because I'm the same addict inside, but that same trait can be focused for a person who can be a game changer. So a game changer is a leader with a new vision. Someone who sets significant new rules for the game and life and also creates new and exciting ideas for others to follow. We all want to be game changers, correct? That's what we all dream to be, to make a difference in the world and make a difference in our community. I have something in this cup that potentially could kill you if you ingest too much. What do you think it is? Yes, it could be water. So there was a story, Jennifer Strange tried to win a Nintendo Wii by holding her Wii, okay? So, so literally, that was what it's called, hold your Wii to win a Nintendo Wii. She's a mother of three. So she's drinking all this water in a drinking contest, and she starts getting headaches, and people start laughing at her, going, come on, it's water. It's, how, can, how can that be harmful? She ended up dying because her brain swole to the point where she had seizures, and she basically fainted in her bathroom and left her three kids behind. So if anything that caused a physiological change in your body, it can be harmful. So I'm going to prevent... I'm going, to, I'm going to present you scientific evidence on how gaming can be a neurological drug. So this is from peer-reviewed research. We know that your hand-eye coordination is increased. So gamers who play games are better surgeons than their attending physicians who don't play games. Okay, baseball players who play video games for half an hour a day, their vision can increase from 2020 to 2010 vision. So the UCR Riverside baseball team their entire batting average improved, and this was published in a scientific paper because they were playing games for half an hour a day. But it's not like the games that you're thinking of. It's games that increase their hand-eye coordination, kind of like the Wii Sports. It reduces anxiety and stress. It's great for enhancing your memory because neurons that fire together, wire together. So learning games are great. I call them digital veggies. Great training tools. We're going to talk about digital veggies later. It can solve science problems. It even can help you cope with post-traumatic stress syndrome. So in the military, we're using video games to help warriors deal with their PTSD. And it can be a painkiller. So this is a burn victim. Very painful. But when we hook this gamer, or this actually burn victim, onto a game called Snow World, he's throwing snowballs, virtual snowballs, against penguins and snowmen in the game. It deadens his pain so much that the nurse can rip the bandages off his burns and scrub his burns every day to treat his burns. It's a painkiller. This thing is a visual distractor, but it's also causing physiological arousal. So you all know about the things you shouldn't look at on the internet, right? Like bare skin. That causes physiological arousal. Think about that. When you look at that thing, it causes physiological arousal. Your whole body starts to create neuroendocrine hormones. So whether you ingest it, inject it, or, or, or it, or put it on your skin or whatever, or touch it, if it causes changes in your brain and neuroendocrine system, it's like a drug. So gamers who play video games that are violent within 30 minutes of gameplay, their blood pressure goes up to 190 over 140. That's a problem. So when I was playing 50 to 100 hours a week, I had my blood pressure so high that I had high cholesterol problems, I had hypertension, and I also had physical ailments because of my high blood pressure. So if gaming is a new digital drug, you can have problems with addiction. The big one is sleep deprivation. So we're working on a case report now where three Service members came in with depression, suicidal ideation, and basically lack of focus, 
and they got dinged for their work performance. So they go up to, you know, they show up in mental health, and when we asked them the question about gaming, they were gaming 30 to 60 hours a week on top of their full-time job. Because of the sleep deprivation, they were having depression, suicidal ideation, and even homicidal thoughts. This one guy was thinking about sawing people's heads off. But when we took them back away from the games and they got their sleep, everything turned back to normal, nearly normal, as normal it can be. Gamer rage, depression, anxiety, antisocial behaviors, failure to achieve potential, and also even family abuse and violent behaviors can result from severe addiction. So I think that it's less about the content, but more about the sleep deprivation and the addiction. So I know that because the addiction rate's one in 11, you all know somebody, somebody who plays too much games, have failed out of school, or stay at home with their parents now, live in their, base, live in their parents' basement, and just play games all day. So what's the MRI evidence? This is a classic paper in, um, uh, from, the, from, from Asia that shows that when gamers who are addicted and they're showing images of gameplay, their brain lights up in the dopamine pathways in the prefrontal cortex. That's the pathway that gives you pleasure when you get excited, when you do things that are pleasurable. Their brain lights up like somebody who's addicted to drugs and alcohol. So what happens when we take people away from their addiction? Now, keep in mind that this video is edited, so if you hear bleep bleep, it's the swear words that I edit out, but it sounds like Tinkerbell because I couldn't find the, the actual beep beep. Okay, so my boyfriend just left to go to the store because he has to get smokes, and he thinks he's going to be raiding all night. But let's see about that. All he does is sit on this stupid computer and play this stupid game. And I'm getting sick of it. I'm going to delete all his things. This one was his favorite. Okay, now. Let's see what his reaction is when he gets back. Pretty crazy, wasn't it? But sadly, that was not a um, rare occurrence in my own home. So I was that person who was rageful. So, so my kids, who you know, Nick and Kate are out there, remember me. Every third word was a swear word for me because I was always angry. I was sleep deprived and always angry about the online play, right? Because I want to get it back online and play against other people, or I have a game to win. So it can really overtake you. And so literally, it got so bad that my wife slapped the restraining order on me and she actually separated from me for six months. So I nearly lost my marriage, number one. Number two, I had all these health problems. And number three, I failed my third step of my medical boards. I should have been studying for my USMLE to get my license to be a doctor, but I was playing games 50 to 100 hours a week. I almost didn't even become a doctor. So I almost lost my life over this. So when I see these game gamers react this way, I can really relate because I was there. So here's the problem. Digital candy versus digital veggies. The LA school district did this test 
they purchased $1 billion worth of iPads and gave it to their students. Within two weeks, you know what the students did? They jailbroke it for pornography and video games. Because the problem is, the, your minds don't fully develop until you're age 25. So the frontal lobe that allows you to have self-control and discernment is not fully developed until you're age 25. And so when we give a device to a young child, the first thing they're thinking about is Facebook, Twitter, social media, you know, all the fun stuff. That is the digital candy. They're not even thinking about spelling games. They're, like, they're thinking about like Minecraft, you know, RuneScape, World of Warcraft, War of the Clans. So it's a struggle between the digital veggies versus digital candy. But when the administrator and the parents give it to the child, they're thinking hangman, spelling games, right? So this is the problem that we're facing. But keep in mind that too much candy will lead to this, right? So too much digital media, including Facebook and, and, and sleep deprivation because you're keeping your phones on all night, as well as too much gaming, will lead this to your brain. So these are spec scans by, by Daniel Amen that shows basically the blood perfusion in the brain. Notice how there's holes in the brain. So literally this is very similar to someone with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So when you're sleep deprived, your reaction time are lower, your ability to handle stress is low, and your, your hair trigger rage is now increased because you don't have the brain capacity to even reason or even be, be rational. So this is a healthy brain. It's fully perfused, and it takes about 30 to 45 days to get back to normal. So that's why typically rehab centers take about 30 days to get the, the addict thinking clearly. But when they're in the state of the, what I call the holy brain syndrome here, their, their neuroendocrine system is talking to you. You can't even reason with them at that point. So that's why you have to unplug the, the addict in order to, to actually communicate. So these are brain scans from the National Institutes of Mental Health. Blue are brain areas that are solidified. These are areas that have been pruned and basically um, uh, solidified in the brain in terms of neuronal pathways. Yellow, red, and green are young brains. So notice that when the child is really young, it's mainly young brain, where it can be molded and changed. At about age 12, the brain starts to take on more of the bluish color. And as you progress to 20 and then 25, that's when your brain fully matures. But notice how the brain matures from back to front. The front part is that frontal lobe that allows you to reason and have discernment and have self-control. So let me ask you this question. Which side do you want to train yourself to be somebody you dream to be? On the young side or when you're over 12? What do you think? On the left-hand side? Raise your hand you think the left-hand side is where you want to train a child. Exactly, because you can't teach an old dog what? Exactly. So think about that. How many people you know say, oh, I could have been that football player, or I could have made professional baseball? And you look at them, you're like, yeah, if you got off the couch and actually practiced. But it makes no use to practice when you're 30. You need to practice when you're six. But our society kind of has it backwards. We want to basically ignore the young children and put them in front of digital screens. And in the Kaiser Foundation, now has done research to show that the average American child uses seven hours and 38 minutes a day in front of a digital screen for entertainment. But the research shows that one hour of screen time is what's recommended, and there's scientific benefit to that. But you, you, you lose the benefit after three hours of digital media a day. Our country is two and a half times over that amount. So this is my son, Nicholas when he's about 12, 12 years old. So being a gaming addict, I got all my kids and family addicted too. I got my wife addicted, I got my son addicted, because if they were addicted in front of their own screens, I could play 50 to 100 hours a week. You see my, my mentality here? But here's the problem, when I became unaddicted and I finally you know, could see the, the, the bigger picture, I noticed that Nicholas was starting to get addicted. So we started weaning him off the Call of Duty. But the problem is when we took him off the Call of Duty and said, okay, okay, boy, you can only play Saturday and Sunday for one hour each. 
he would then think about it from Monday to Friday about Call of Duty. That's all he talked about in the car. My wife was ready to strangle me because that's all my son talked about, even though we weaned him down to two hours a day, just on the weekends. Then finally, his grades hit the drop. His, he became obsessed with it. And then one day, I caught him playing at 3 o'clock in the morning before a soccer tournament. And he was like, Dad, I can't help it. i got to get my game on before the soccer tournament because I won't be able to get my fix before basically this weekend. That's when we just took everything away. But then I couldn't fix him. And so at this age, he didn't have a dad that poured into him. And sadly, at this age, people would pick on him and he was an easy target because he didn't have, you know, the courage and the, and the bravery of having a father feeding, in, feeding into him. So luckily, I found the Lord and I became saved years before that. So I knew the Bible. So I said, son, I can't fix you, but the Lord can. So let's start reading the Bible together. Let's, you know, let's, let's have, you know, you go youth group. You know, Pastor Steve is pouring into him. I mean, so many people poured into him in this church, godly people. And then finally he found his gift. And so what he found was that he was a super fast runner. So when we took away the games, he stopped thinking about the games. He starts to stop thinking about the internet. And he tried long distance running for the first time just exactly one year ago. And this kid... Is super fast. He runs a mile in like 411. Okay, we didn't, we had no idea how fast he was. So he he goes to Great Elk High School, but he's praying for his team. He's guiding people to the Lord. He'll do, he'll argue with them about Jesus and how Jesus changed his life. So he's sharing his testimony. And so he's running the 800, 155, 411, 1600. He runs a two mile 905. Within one year, he was able to manifest this incredible talent, and he has like over 20 Div Division I schools calling him now. So he traded the leaderboard, his, his Call of Duty leaderboard, for a real leaderboard. And at one time, he was the number one, number two, and number three runner in, in the U.S. If I didn't unplug the games and listen to my wife, we would have missed this opportunity. Because if he had ran fast as a young adult in his 20s, it may have been too late for him to, to go to college on a running scholarship. So this is his testimony. Hi, my name's Nick Down. Uh, when I was younger, my dad, he wasn't really there for me. He was mostly playing video games, and uh, he got me addicted to it. And ever since then, um, I just played a lot. I got uh, really addicted to online, online, uh, on, just online addiction to everything and then uh, my life came crashing down because that's all I knew. When my parents were having a hard time uh, dealing with each other because of gaming, uh, my mom left and went to Oregon with my grandma and my mom and I and my little sister Caitlin, uh, we were just, you know, by ourselves with my mom and pretty much had no idea of of what a dad was. They didn't divorce, but they got back together and uh, we started living together again. And my dad finally quit gaming and then he forced me to stop gaming. And I wasn't ready for that. Both my dad and I had to find something else. I found the track, my dad found motivational speaking and companies. I ran my first race, I ran the 550, and I remember uh, dying the last 150, and just complete pain, just complete pain, but it was so much joy because I knew it was over, and from that very moment on, I knew that I had something going for me that I was gonna be a runner. I'm, like, the funny thing is with running is, the more pain you inflict on yourself, the faster you go, and. It's not about how hard you hit somebody, it's how, how much pain you can take and keep going and keep going and finish through the line. The only thing that's telling you or restricting you is yourself, that you can do it. It's just, you need to tell yourself, you need to be confident because if you tell yourself you can't, you can't. If you tell yourself you can, you can. Ever since my dad's been talking about gaming, he's been opening the eyes of people who have not uh, not heard of the topic of video game addiction and online addiction 
and how it's ruining little kids' lives, and and it's really sad. So he wants to help people. Not many people have been talking about it. It's it's awesome. I love my dad, and he's 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 shown me that anybody can change. So clearly not everyone can, can be a fast runner. But in your DNA, the Lord has programmed, and I know it, he has programmed something very special that's only unique to you and your talents and your passion and your love for life and other people. But if you are not able to unplug yourself from addictive behaviors, regardless what it is, because all addictions are the same, when we get the addict off of smoking, they'll go to something else. They'll go to food. We get them off food. They'll go to you know, things online that they shouldn't be. So until you fix that desire to numb the pain, to escape from addictions, you won't be able to find this God-given gift that, that the Lord's given you through your DNA. That's the beautiful thing about this. So you're special. And that's what I want to do with these, these talks is that every one of you, I know that you have circumstances that have been perhaps, you know, uh, less fortunate than other people. I mean, I grew up with the name Andrew Doan, not. I grew up with the name Fung Duc Duan, okay? So I was in a time when being a Vietnamese kid was not cool, okay? And unfortunately, there was a movie called 16 Candles, and there was this main character named Long Duck Dong. So I was the Fong Duck Dong of the neighborhood, okay? And then my brother was Fong Ding Dong. <laughs> Fong Duck Dong and Fong Ding Dong. Okay, that was a bad thing. And so, so I didn't have a lot of self-esteem. So when I entered a marriage where, you know, my wife would speak to me and I felt like it was criticism, I would lash back with anger rather than be humble and receive the criticism because I had a broken upbringing. But you all have a long duck dong and long ding dong, you know, situation in your, in your lives. So that's why I'm here to encourage you is through the Lord, you can find how to, you know, overcome that. And so my daughter, I'm going to talk about my daughter real quick. So, so, of course, I get her addicted to computers too, but she played less games but more social media because that's what young ladies like. So she loves social media. So Facebook became her game. The likes, the little, you know, selfies, right? So finally we took, the face, we, we took Facebook away and we said, you need to go to church, and there's a program called Teen Landing, which is the 12-step program, the teen version here on Thursday nights. And she just went crazy. She's like, no way. I don't want to go to this thing. This is like, no, no, no. She's like, she felt like it was this death to her that she had to come to this, you know, thing to recover from her social media obsession. But you know what that did? She found her love in singing. And so she was up here doing worship. And I taped her a few days ago because I was encouraging her to sing the national anthem for the school. And she goes, I'm not good enough. And I said, let's just tape this and, and see how good you are. And she's amazing. So I just want to share this clip with you. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight Over the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rockets rang The bombs burst singing air Gave proof through the night That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave. So, on your chairs, there's flyers about internet gaming disorder. 
there are signs and symptoms that you should be aware of. So it's really not about the time that people play, but it's about the dysfunction that one manifests in an activity, right? Like that guy breaking his computer, that's a bad thing. So that would be one ding for addictive behavior, right? And then also, at the end of the month, September 30th, um, at the Old Town Theater, we're partnering with Opal Singleton. And what, what really breaks my heart right now is that the sex traffickers and the human traffickers are using social media, Facebook, Twitter, and online gamings, gaming activities to capture our youth's attention and then for entrapment into human trafficking. So I invite you all to come to that talk. So we're gonna focus more about the social aspect, how people fall in love with fantasy lovers online, and that can lead to somebody to be invited to a park, and then the next thing they know it, they're trapped, and they're stuck in sex trafficking. This is a very real thing, and this is the number one crime now in the United States, with over a million kids being traf trafficked every year. And, um, and so I invite you to partner with us and spread the word about that. Thank you.